Netflix, Facebook, all this stuff is down pretty significantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robin Hood. I mean, just like they're all down. Is the bleeding over or is this just the start of something that could get way, way worse? Yeah, no, I, I still think it's the start of something that's going to get worse, uh, way, way worse. You know, for Netflix in particular, probably not. I mean, that thing was down 30, 40 percent. Um, but, but the point is, like, wh- you know, when you're in these sort of financial market bubbles, I think we can all agree that, you know, the past couple of years it was a bubble pull up a chart of pretty much anything uh, on a log, certainly on a, on a non log scale. When you're in these bubbles in the equity market, you know, there's always kind of like one or two big companies that come out and, you know, report something, either earnings or guidance that's really negative and causes the stock to collapse. You know, and that's usually the beginning of the end of the bubble. I would argue Facebook last quarter was kind of like the the, the predecessor for, for this move we're seeing in Netflix. But you go back to the, uh, you know, the housing bubble. Um, Bear Stearns kind of collapsing in 2007 was a was a big deal. Uh, you go back to the, t- the prior tech bubble, uh, you know, 2000, uh, Qualcomm kind of missed and, and got it down. And that was kind of the end of the tech bubble. And so there's always these sort of like seminal moments when you look back in time and say, hey, look, that's kind of when like the whole valuation narrative change and the kind of range of probable outcomes that investors would assign to val- value these companies, you know, really started to shift downward. And I think that's exactly what Netflix has kind of given us the look on. When you start to see this, uh, how do you know when the market's bottomed? Like, should people look for certain uh, signs to say, like, okay, now's the time to deploy capital, which I think is what Ackman was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Netflix had already fallen. Then he went in to buy some, and he said, you know, we're so glad that the market provided this opportunity for Mm -hmm. us. And then it fell another 35%. So I don't think he thought uh, he was buying something that was falling. I think he thought he was buying something that was heavily discounted, uh, and it was basically bottoming, and then he would – benefit on the recovery. So what are the signs that you look for for the stock market to quote unquote have bottom? Yeah. So it's obviously it's impossible to, to not impossible without luck, but it's it's very difficult to, to ascertain tops or bottoms in real time. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you have to rely on a, a, like different sets of indicators to give you a good sense. So, you know, for something like on a fundamental side of things, when you're looking for a bottom, what you want to find is, is sort of one B within, you know, one or two quarters of a, of a real second derivative inflection and in growth. Uh, and generally speaking, you want to be in that part of the process where the third derivative is already improving. It's already positive. So, you know, that kind of is like the the first sign that you're getting close to the bottom from a fundamental standpoint. From a policy standpoint, you obviously want to be very close to a dovish pivot out of the Fed or out of the major central bank of the, you know, kind of economy that you're you're investing in, China, PBOC, you know, ECB. Uh, and so, like, we're obviously not anywhere close to that. We're nowhere close to a growth bottom. And then typically when you have an event in asset markets, and this could be for single stocks, could be for credit, could be for the broader index, you know, typically what happens if you're you're already having a problem, investors tend to o- overpay for volatility, near-term, short data protection. And what typically marks the bottom is sort of, you know, rolling past the, the exp- expiration of those options. They evaporate. They don't, you know, they don't exist anymore. Investors monetize those options. And then the dealers who sort of have to short futures, short things to kind of uh, hedge that that risk to the downside, they start to unwind those trades. Mm-hmm. And that tends to create that force of bottom. So neither of those three things, which I would be looking for to ascertain a bottom in something like Netflix or the broader stock market have occurred yet. So when we start to think about uh, the reason why some of this has happened, uh, stocks got super overheated. There's all this undisciplined monetary fiscal policy. We talked about that uh, quite uh, quite a bit. Um, there's a very interesting comment uh, that I saw. Uh, I think it's the Alliance Economic Advisor, uh, Mohammed El Iran. Alliance, yeah, Mohammed El Iran. Yep. And uh, what he described was this idea that the Federal Reserve may actually move their inflation target from two percent to three percent. So I went down this deep. You know, uh, rabbit hole did this whole uh, look at that's a fifty percent increase. That don't didn't take me that much of a deep dive <laughs> to figure deal. out, uh, right? But what is an inflation target? How does it work, right? I wrote all this stuff, and the deeper I got it, I was like, this may be one of the biggest stories in finance right now that doesn't seem to be getting a lot of attention. But like, enormous. do you think that they would raise the inflation target from two to three percent? Like, what would the ramifications of that be? So uh, let's let's talk about what the, let's go backwards because the ramifications are more interesting than whether or not if I think they'll do it or not. I don't think they'll do it. That's the kind of quick takeaway. Uh, the ramifications are very, very positive because it means the Fed has more leeway from an inflation standpoint in terms of their reaction function. Okay. So if you have a higher inflation target, all things being equal, you don't need to tighten as much to get inflation back towards neutral, Got or back towards the, the target. You know, right now, core PC, which is their preferred metric, 
is running a, at a preposterously low 5.4 percent. <laughs> it doesn't even sound right when you say it out loud, but let's just say it's 5.4 percent. That's still you know 240 base or sorry 340 basis points above uh, where where they're you know so where the midpoint of their target range is. So that's a big deal. Um, but if it was only 240 basis points, they would have to do less tightening, less quantitative yep. tightening, all that stuff. And so whether or not they'll do it, the reason I don't think they'll do it is because you know when you look at most polls, you know whether it be consumer confidence readings, you know Gallup polls or any sort of like politically oriented poll, inflation really for the past few months has really been the dominant sort of number one fear factor in America. It's been the number one reason why people are pissed off. And so for me, I think the Federal Reserve just kind of give it reading the tea leaves between the Biden administration, Jay Powell, Janet Yellen, and all the kind of commentary we're hearing back and forth. It strikes me that they realize that in, if inflation got worse and if they were deemed to be perceived to be perceived to be doing uh, less than they already are to combat inflation, that would actually exacerbate the problem, make it worse for Democrats to have a, a successful outcome in November, although they're probably not going to have a successful outcome in November. It's the last time we'll see a dual Democrat majority for quite quite some time. Hey, you, did you like this video? Great. We make five of them a day and post them here on this channel. Make sure you subscribe, like the video and see you next time.